So welcome everyone. Welcome to our first session of NAFA's Business Performance Center's Impact Week. My name is Suzanne Carowin. I am the Vice President of Marketing Communications here for NAFA. I'm delighted to welcome everyone today and we're excited to get kicked off. If you missed the previous session, we had a special legislative session on the PRO Act. If you missed that one, it was a great one, but don't worry because we have it all on demand and you'll receive that along with all the downloadable slides at the end of the week. So again, excited to kick off day one. To all of our members, welcome. Thank you for being a member. Thank you for belonging to your professional association. And if you're a guest today of NAFA and you're visiting us for the first time, welcome. We're delighted to have you here and we're delighted to kind of showcase some of the work that we do. So the Business Performance Center, if you're not familiar with it, we launched it last year, <clears throat> not the most fortuitous time, but what it is is an online hub of content, events, experts, like we'll hear from uh, Ron Lee here in a second, um, and a way for us to really get the word out and it's a give back to the industry. The Business Performance Center focuses in specifically on practice management and how we uh, can do a better job in building out our book of business um, as we go into it through our career. So a few housekeeping notes before we get going. First, everyone's in meeting mode. So we do have everybody muted by default. If you could stay on mute, that would be great. If you wanna be on camera, it's up to you. Um, but what we do need to say is then, we do want you to still participate. So feel free to raise the, to use a chat function or raise your hand. And again, as our speakers are inclined, they will take questions at the end and we're happy to moderate and ask those on your behalf as well. As I said, all of the sessions will be recorded. We will put them all onto a uh, on-demand archive. We'll include the downloadable slides for your uh, later viewing, et cetera. And also at the end of today, you will receive an email with a feedback survey. We would so appreciate you taking a couple of minutes to fill that out, to give us that information back as to what you thought of the content, other topics that you would like us to cover, et cetera, other areas that you want the business center, uh, the business performance center rather to cover. We would be most appreciative of that. So to kick off the day, we are delighted to bring you a top popular speaker from our actual advanced practices track. So we have uh, put together this track and we've done this for the last two years in collaboration with the Society of Financial Service Professionals. And so today our kickoff speaker is Mr. Ron Lee from Mutual of Omaha. who has been a very popular speaker over the last two years. We've had symposia, we had in-person events, we turned into a case study and a multi-week multi webinar series. And all of those have been phenomenally received. And, um, and so we're bringing Ron back again today. <clears throat> so, um, in that, we want to thank FSP for the tremendous support and content they brought to NAPA. We look forward to doing more collaboration. And I'll be the first to tell you that actually the series has been so popular that we're actually going to spin off the advanced practice series piece into its own center. And we're happy to announce that today. So our work there with FSP and NAPA has just been incredibly um, well received and people just keep saying more, please. So that's what we're aiming to do. So I'm delighted then to then turn the floor over to Mr. Ron Lee who's going to talk to us about life insurance supplements and in how they handle how they fit into the financial plan. So with that, Ron, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Suzanne. I really appreciate the opportunity to join everybody here and participate in uh, the great work that NAFA and FSP do uh, because it's so, so important. And and I am hoping that I will get to share my screen, but uh, I think they need to allow me to do that. Otherwise, you guys are going to have to look at me for 45 minutes, and I don't think that anybody wants that. So uh, there we go. Okay, so uh, let's get it started and talk a little bit about how life insurance supplements the financial plan. Uh, and I want to give a little background on how I got here, because I really do think it's important to understand that. Uh, many years ago, I was at an industry conference, and at that industry conference, uh, the speaker uh, was talking about how it was interesting that at that time, uh, people could explain really, really complex concepts to clients, but then if you ask them to explain how life insurance supplements a financial plan, it would stump them, right? Holistically, how does this thing work? How does it make a financial plan better? And truthfully, uh, I didn't really know. 
so I excitedly grabbed my pen and pad folio. Yes, it was that long ago. Uh, and, and started uh, uh, to write down notes. Unfortunately, uh, the person uh, did not go into how it actually supplements the financial plan. Uh, he was just bemoaning the fact that people couldn't explain it. So years later, uh, we put together this presentation because I really do think it's important to understand this. Um, if uh, what, what we need to understand is that life insurance is a critical, a critical part of a uh, successful financial plan, but not just at death. It really has to be during life if you want to talk about permanent insurance, right? If you're only worried about the financial plan at the death of the breadwinner, usually you just need term insurance, right? Uh, because you're covering that during the working years. And so if we can figure out how to convey why permanent life insurance is such a great thing to have uh, as part of your financial plan while you're still alive, while you're still accumulating assets, then we've gone a long ways towards it. And so here's the problem that, that we see. The problem that we see is this. We know that people understand the need for life insurance, right? We know that they say, oh, if I die prematurely and someone is dependent upon me for my income, I need income replacement. So I need life insurance. If uh, I have a partner uh, in a business and we have a buy-sell agreement, then we need to fund that with life insurance. If I have children and one big indivisible asset uh, that we want to pass to one child and not the other, we need life insurance. So there's obviously many, many different things that, that a person can do with the life insurance there, but we're really thinking about it very transactionally, right? Because we are saying, I have a single problem and life insurance can manage that problem. And so people are, are generally very responsible, right? They'll buy the life insurance. They will buy the term insurance. But when you get to the point of where you say, well, but permanent insurance would be better, they don't usually like to do that. And the reason that they don't want to do that is that they don't want to think they're paying more for life insurance than they have to. Because if they pay more for the life insurance than they absolutely have to, then they can't take that money and spend it on other things. So the difference between the term and the permanent uh, premiums. So maybe they just want to take their family on a vacation. Maybe they want to buy a nicer car. Now, we all might say, well, those are pretty selfish reasons not to uh, do better planning, right? But we all do it to a certain extent, right? We don't live a Spartan lifestyle. We all like to have some nice things in our life. So we all do those things. But in addition, people might also say, you know, but I also want to pay for my kid's education. Uh, and I don't understand how permanent insurance might help me with that. Or maybe I just have monthly bills and I can't afford the higher premium at this point. Or they might say, I want to put it in my 401k or I want to start an IRA because my path to that tropical island that I talked about on the last slide uh, is going to come through the market. And every dollar that I am not spending on life insurance, I can reallocate to a different part of my financial plan. And until you overcome that, then you are going to struggle uh, with the permanent life insurance with a lot of folks. So here's what I propose to you guys. And that is this, cash accumulation life insurance makes sense, but only if it helps people accomplish their goals. It doesn't help if it replaces the goals, right? Do this instead of that. And people want to choose that, right? So 50% of the time, just you know that if you say take A or B, People are going to take A half the time, B the other half of the time. And then you, you stack on the fact that they can really see a 401k grow and their friends are all buying, uh, investing in their uh, company's 401k as well. And it becomes more likely that they're going to buy term and invest the difference. So we have to understand how it is that this permanent life insurance actually makes their financial plan better than it was before. So what we're going to do today over the next 35 or so minutes 
is we are going to talk about Ted and Lisa. And Ted and Lisa uh, are a 50 year old couple. They're both 50. They have a couple of kids. Uh, Lisa self employed. Uh, and uh, they've done actually a pretty good job. So the question is, is what would they benefit from uh, by getting permanent life insurance? So let's take a look at what they've done already. We know Lisa has a successful small business. Uh, they have two 401ks between us, three IRAs from previous 401ks. They have a joint investment account, a joint savings account, term insurance, a nice house, and three rental properties. Anybody who says that these two people haven't done the responsible thing or haven't done a good job are going to be chased out of this house, right? Because they have done a good job with what they knew. So why would permanent life insurance help? Why would life insurance make financial sense while Ted and Lisa, number one, are still alive, but number two, also in the accumulation phase? So we are going to talk a little bit uh, and, and really, I'm splitting this in, in two, if you will. I'm going to talk about Ted and Lisa during the accumulation phase, and then we're going to switch over and talk about Ted and Lisa in their distribution phase in retirement, because life insurance is going to play a great role in both, even though we haven't started until age 50. So why should they think about permanent life insurance? And Number one, they really have to ask themselves if their assets are really diversified. Are they really, right? So the problem that we have with asset correlation is that if assets are correlated, then they tend to either move up or move down at the same time. It's great when they're all moving up, right? It's terrible when it's all moving down. But we all expect that the market, for example, in real estate will go up sometimes, go down sometimes. The problem is that if you face a situation where the, uh, where the assets are down, then we have to look and say, boy, I hope we don't need that money now, right? So we look at Ted and Lisa's life and what might happen to them just in the next 15 years, for example. So we know that Ted or Lisa Either one of them could get sick and need care. We know that their parents or their kids could get sick. And if they do, that will certainly impact Ted and Lisa's ability to pay the bills. Maybe it'll impact their ability to earn money, but it certainly uh, is going to take a hit uh, or give them a hit in the savings, right? So maybe Lisa's business starts to go under. Uh, it might be a great business, but what if she's competing head on with Amazon or Walmart or something like that? We can't guarantee that her business is going to be around forever. Ted might lose his job. They might get sued by anybody. There can be any of any huge of a thousand different reasons why they might need their money between now and retirement. And if all of their assets are moving in lock, lock step, then we better hope that those assets are up when that liquidity need comes up. And that's what life insurance can do. But what might Ted and Lisa do? What do people usually do to manage that risk? Well, they usually go to bonds, right? Or they might go to cash. They might use fixed annuities. And all of those can make sense. But what I want to propose to you today is what about life insurance for that portion of the portfolio, right? I think sometimes, and, and I'm going to climb on my soapbox just for a second here. I think that sometimes people will say that, uh, that IUL can be a replacement for uh, a person's stock market investments, for example. And I do not believe that to be true. Personally, I think that the money that should go to IUL should represent the fixed portion of a person's portfolio right? If you do that because of your zero, for example, and you're not expecting to get 10, 11, 12% in an IUL, then you are going to fare much better over the long run. So a quick talking point that we have found to be really, really successful is this. People have been talking about zero is your hero since IUL first came out, and it's been pretty effective. But I'll tell you what people find more compelling, and that is this, 
the annual reset. Here's what I'm talking about. We all know that losing money in the distribution phase, which we'll talk about later, is a terrible thing. But it's also really bad to lose money in the accumulation phase. So maybe you're thinking about the Warren Buffett quote where he said, rule number one is don't lose money. Rule number two is don't forget about rule number one, right? And so we know that during the accumulation phase, it's important that we don't take a big hit. And just by way of example, because I'm not going to try and do the difficult math here, let's say I have $100. And with that $100, I'm hoping, obviously, to have some gains in the future. But let's say in year one, the market goes down 40%, right? So the market drops 40%, which doesn't happen often, but happens. And then I have $60. Here is the importance of the annual reset. Forget zero is your hero and say, next year we're starting over and you're still starting with $100. Because next year, if you hope to make five, six, seven, eight percent, whatever it is in your portfolio, you're starting at 60 over there. Over here, you're starting at 100. And that is going to make a huge difference when we start adding up the numbers after 15, 20 years. So talk about the annual reset. I am surprised at how compelling uh, people have found that to be when, uh, when agents share that. So what might a life insurance policy look like? Uh, so we're going to uh, start a, and we're gonna run a $600,000 income advantage IUL where Lisa is going to pay $25,000 of annual premium for 20 years. She's preferred, she's 50, okay? So we know that they've done pretty well. Uh, so we believe that, that she's capable of putting in $25,000 per year. Now, the first benefit of doing that is the obvious one, right? The cash values are gonna provide Ted and Lisa, Lisa in particular here, because we're talking about life insurance for her, with a guaranteed minimum return, that of course being zero. Now, don't mistake that for saying you can never lose money in a life insurance policy, because obviously you can if you take a zero in a year when you are also paying mortality expenses, policy expenses, things like that, your account value can still go down and, and will go down, as a matter of fact, uh, if you get a zero. But the actual crediting rate is never going to be lower than zero. So what kind of cash values are we actually talking about here? And, and it's, it's not huge, right? If you would hope to show 10, 12% uh, in uh, some type of, of equity investments, but here we say $25,000 per year. After 10 years, we have over $315,000. After 20 years, we have over $885,000. All that Lisa can use for any of those things that came up before, right? We talked about Lisa's business could go under. We talked about how Ted could lose his job. Somebody could get sick, any of those things. We can go get that money and we don't have to worry about what the market did earlier this year or last year or whenever it was that drove our cash values down, right? We know we talk about that in the distribution phase, but it's really important in the accumulation phase that we don't sell into that down market because then we're locking in our losses. So any of those unexpected cash needs, instead of having the bonds or the cash or the fixed annuities, they should at least consider permanent life insurance because it can be a great replacement for those things or supplement. If you don't wanna go all in with IUL, then certainly uh, put a portion of it that you would have had in the fixed portion of your portfolio. So there's no requirement to wait until after age 59 and a half, unless it's a modified endowment contract. Uh, so that is a great benefit. Obviously, I can't get into any of my retirement accounts until age 59 and a half. Uh, except maybe my 401k, uh, but then I'm going to have to turn 55 and separate from service, neither of which I'm terribly excited about. So uh, I don't want to have to do that if I can avoid it. 
uh, once I turn 72, there will be no obligation for me to take required minimum distributions either. So it really is a very flexible way to use money. We know that you can get tax advantage withdrawals. So as long as it's not a MEC, I can either withdraw to basis or I can take loans from that policy. And those loans and those withdrawals to basis are gonna be income tax free. Really important that the client understand that if you're taking loans from this policy, the policy has to stay in force until death, right? Because if you don't stay in, or if it doesn't stay in force until death, then those loans that are forgiven might be taxable, at least to the extent that there's gain in the policy. So we wanna be really, really careful uh, that people understand that. Uh, and we'll talk about that again a little bit later on how much we should distribute because we do have to keep that in there. But what else can it do? It can provide tax diversification to this portfolio and be a complement to those taxable and deferrable and deferred uh, accounts. So I think a lot of people are starting to talk now about having three buckets of money. I want my tax deferred money. So my 401k, my IRA, whatever that might be. I want my currently taxable money because I, I need savings. But shouldn't I also have some never taxable money. And how do we get never taxable money? We get that from life insurance for one. We can get that from Roth IRAs. We can get that from uh, Roth accounts in a 401k. We can actually get that from income from a muni bond fund too. Uh, but of course, muni bond fund has its own risks that we see people facing right now. So consider whether you need to have different buckets. And why is that? Because if you ask your clients if they think what, uh, that tax rates are going to go up or down, almost all of them will say they think they're going to go up. That's something I happen to share, right? What I also know is I've been wrong about a whole lot of things in the past, right? So I'm not putting all of my eggs in any particular basket. I want to have flexibility when the time comes to take money that I'm going to be able to pick which bucket I'm going to take it from, depending on my needs at the time. We know that life insurance is fantastic for creditor protection. Uh, obviously, it really depends on your state. Uh, some states provide great protection. Some of them just provide some protection, right? So uh, take a look at your individual state if you're wondering how much uh, life insurance is protected there. Uh, but it's a great asset for that doesn't work. It isn't quite as well protected as your 401k. And certainly your IRAs have uh, some protection built in uh, at the state law level, uh, but your bank account certainly don't. Uh, ask anybody who's been garnished lately, I suppose. Uh, so uh, having that benefit is, is fantastic. We know that it's going to enhance the ability to obtain credit. So maybe I'll go back into my life insurance policy and borrow the money. And that's one way to use the credit, or I might use it as collateral for a loan. So again, be careful that the policy is not a mech, uh, but if you assign this policy as collateral for a loan, you are going to be more credit worthy in many situations, especially if there is not other collateral uh, that, you would, uh, that you can post at that point. So it's a great asset for that. Uh, again, we talked about this a little bit before, but it is an uncorrelated asset. And you might argue, and, and rightfully so, well, I thought I got to participate in the market. And the answer is, yes, you are correct. You are getting to participate somewhat in the market, depending on, uh, on the indices that are used. We use the S&P 500, right? And so depending on the policy, it's either going to have a cap uh, or it's going to have a participation rate or it's going to have both. Uh, so you are participating in the upswing of the market. Here's why I say it's uncorrelated. It's uncorrelated because it provides diversification against losses in the market. If the market loses 40%, I get a zero, right? That's what IUL does. So we don't have to reach into those assets that are down at that point. Rather, we can reach into the asset that took a zero last year, which is so much better than going into the asset that lost. 
40% last year. So then here's, here's the thing. So Ted and Lisa, now 20 years have gone by, they're thinking about retirement and you have to ask yourself, man, they put all that money into the life insurance. None of those bad things happened. Nobody needed care. Nobody lost their job. The business went, went along just fine and they never dipped into it. And so was that a waste of money? I mean, would they have been better off just taking that money and buying term insurance and invest in the rest? And the answer is that no. Why? Because as an actuary, actuary will tell you, number one, there is value in protecting against risks. I didn't waste my money on homeowner's insurance because my house didn't burn down. I didn't waste my money on auto insurance because I didn't wrap my car around a pole, right? That was a risk management tool that I had to pay for. And so there is value in that. But in addition to that, now they have a fantastic source of tax-free retirement income. Remember what I said before, the only ways to do that were Roth IRAs, Roth 401k accounts, or life insurance. So let's take a look at the life insurance. And with this in the accumulation phase, we are putting in $25,000 a year for 20 years. At age 70, we have $885,000. That's pretty good. But that's not the magic of life insurance, right? The magic comes in in the distribution phase. So even though we put in 20 or uh, put in $500,000 all told, we are going to take a total of uh, $3 million of disbursements. And here's what we're doing. We're taking $60,000 for 50 years from age 71 to 120. Now, why do I, I, I want to show you something because I think this is important. There is a real tendency in our business, I think, to run max distributions. And we don't like to do that, at least in my department, right? Uh, what we do is we like to run the max distributions to see what they are, and then we back them down. And here's why. If you get out there and you run max uh, distributions and they are to run out at 75 or 80, you have given your clients no room for error, right? So if the stock market, your particular indice, does not, or your particular index, excuse me, does not perform like you'd hoped it would, or for some reason, the policy did not perform the way that it would, then your clients have to be disappointed, right? So this red number over here that says 952,000, I'll tell you what that is in a second, but it'll say zero uh, at age 75 or 85 or something like that. And we don't want that because we want our clients when they get in retirement, we're here to help them manage risk. We're not here to help them create risk, right? So in this case, we're getting $60,000, which is more than double what we put in for 20 years. And we get it all the way out until this person is 120. And, and these are all non-guaranteed illustrations, obviously. But if you look at this, we built a lot of uh, uh, we put a lot of cushion in here because the cash value is still projected to be $952,000 at age 120. So you can be more conservative if you want. You can run the illustration at a lower uh, interest rate. But with this, what you can do is you can say $60,000. And if things don't work out the way that you want, you can either take less, you can take it for less long, if that's an actual phrase, less long, uh, or um, uh, or we just will have less cushion left over. And you can make that decision far into the future, right? Lisa's 50 now. She doesn't have to decide what she wants her cash value to be at 120. Uh, so she can pivot from that at that point. And that will be very important. So let's talk about what else they could have done with the money, though. So I want to. Uh, bring this up. Sorry for the screen shaking. I just had to move the uh, move the little toolbar over for just a second. I want to share where else they could have put some money. And I want to explain how I came up with these numbers. Now, for those of you who use WinFlex, this is from WinFlex. We happen to have Innsmark also that we could use if we can ever help with something like this. 
but this is called the financial alternatives page. And for my, uh, for my assumptions, I said, let's say you can get 4% on an annuity, okay? Uh, on a fixed stated rate interest uh, or fixed stated interest uh, annuity right now, that would be awfully good, right? You're not actually going to get this. But here's what I want to do with these assumptions. Number one, I want to say we're projecting into the future, right? We're not saying what the rates are today. We're saying what we think we can get in the future. So that's one consideration. The other consideration is I don't want to be accused of sandbagging for the life insurance, right? So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt in these assumptions so that all of the alternatives actually look better uh, uh, compared to the life insurance. So 4% on an annuity, 3% on a money market account, 2% on a CD, 4% on a muni bond fund. Uh, and, and so I want to show you what that's going to look like because I really think this is uh, this is a neat way to show how life insurance can be a great way to demonstrate uh, uh, life insurance as an asset class, if you will. So let's go out to age 70. And you can see, I know this is a bit of an eye test, uh, but there's such good information in here that at age 70, we have a surrender value uh, of $839,091. That's just in the upper left here. If you look uh, just past the line there, it has an after-tax surrender value of $585,090. Why is that? Because there were gains in the policy and we're in a 35% tax bracket. So we had to pay taxes on those gains. So you could walk away with $585,000 and $90, I should say, uh, but why would you, right? Because that's not the smart way to use the camp cash accumulation in the life insurance. The smart way is to take out a stream of income. And so in this case, I said we're getting $60,000 per year after tax. Let's look at what happens with these other uh, alternatives that we put in here. Now, the annuity, we know is tax deferred, but you also have to pay tax on the withdrawals uh, to the extent that you have gain in the policy, right? Because we're not talking about an annuitization here because you wouldn't run out of money with an annuitization, but the payment would be considerably smaller. So we're going to get $60,000 after tax here. And with this, if you look down to about age 84, you will see there's a negative number there. And the last I checked, none of these providers continue to give you money when you are at zero. Right, so we know that uh, at age 83, Lisa had $13,309 left in her annuity. She took the rest and then that annuity is depleted. So the life insurance is still going at $60,000 per year. The annuity is out at age 83. The money market fund, of course, is even worse because it was currently taxable and had a lower interest rate. It runs out of money. She has $19,000 at age 81 uh, and then uh, and, and goes negative the following year. So that's a terrible alternative. The CD uh, obviously is the worst. It, had, it was currently taxable and it had the lowest interest rate. Uh, so it ran, uh, she ran out of money, pardon me, uh, at age 80. So we were only about five years in at that point when the entire CD was depleted at that point. The one that did the very best, as you might expect, it was the Muni Bond Fund. And the Muni Bond Fund, uh, made, she made it all the way out to age 87, where she had uh, $29,000 there, right? But then she went negative. So the, the life insurance is still lasting longer. Now, Muni Bond Funds are great, right? You get tax-free income from them. Uh, if there's capital gains, you don't uh, those are not uh, tax-free, but, but the income from the muni bond fund is tax-free. The problem, of course, is that with a muni bond fund, you might just have a risk of default, right? If life insurance is your alternative, you have a highly rated life insurance company that is providing, uh, providing this. So you don't have as many default worries as you might have uh, buying an individual uh, bond for sure, but maybe even an individual bond fund. 
So life insurance has performed all of those alternatives. It's a fantastic way uh, to generate income in retirement. And as a matter of fact, if you're looking for something like I, I talked about before with the annual reset that clients didn't understand, but they find very interesting is if you say, which of those assets are going to allow you to borrow money uh, from uh, and still allow the remainder, I'm sorry, still allow that borrowed money uh, to accumulate interest. So what that obviously, uh, what I'm talking about is with an indexed loan, then you borrow the money uh, from the life insurance policy, but uh, you, that money still remains in the account and can be credited interest. Now you're going to pay an interest rate. So you have to ask, what is that loan charge? How much is it? And for us, for example, currently it's 4%. Contractually, it's guaranteed to be no more than 6%. And you say, all right, if I can get more than the loan interest rate, then I'm actually getting uh, arbitrage. I'm actually making money on money that I've borrowed. Now, you have to be fair. You have to be fair and say, in years where you take a zero uh, on the crediting rate, if your interest rate, uh, your loan interest rate is 4%, you're losing 4%, right? You can't just show the upside, not the downside. But if you believe over the long run that this policy is going to do better than the loan interest rate, which currently is 4%, then that is absolutely the way you would go. Your clients don't understand that. And they certainly don't understand that it's the only one of those vehicles that would allow for that. But I think I'm telling you guys a lot of things that you may already know. And so I want to spend just a few minutes talking about what else this life insurance is doing in retirement, right? We know that it managed a ton of risks when they were in the accumulation phase. We know that it generated a lot of income in retirement that was income tax free. And that was a great place to put money uh, that uh, is a, a fixed alternative to some of those other things, but aren't there some risks that uh, these two are facing at this point that life insurance can help them with? And I think the answer to that is yes, or I know the answer to that is yes, because we don't know what Ted and Lisa's tax bracket is going to be in retirement, right? We used to say, hey, people's tax, uh, uh, tax bracket will be less in retirement because they're like making less money. Uh, and then of course, recently, uh, a lot of us would say, well, we're guaranteed that life or that taxes have to go up. And so we would expect to maybe be in a higher tax bracket in retirement. And the only answer really is we don't know, right? Especially if we're talking about retirement for someone in 20 years, a whole lot can happen between now and then. So we go back to that idea of having buckets of money, because if we have buckets of money and they are taxable, currently taxable, and, and never taxable, then we can do this. We can manage post-retirement tax brackets. So I can, whatever my tax bracket is, I can fill up that bracket with taxable income and then take the rest from a tax-free source like life insurance or a Roth IRA. It's a great, great way to do that. You can avoid some phase-outs if in fact there are phase-outs of deductions for example, uh, at that point. Uh, if the rules on taxation of social security uh, are still in place, you might be able to manage and avoid taxation uh, of the social security retirement benefits. And uh, if, uh, again, if, if the rules are the same in retirement, we know that the amount of income a person has uh, indicates what type of capital gains tax rate they will pay. So you may be able, again, to manage your capital gains tax brackets uh, and sell maybe a, a stock in retirement uh, because you managed your income earlier in the year. So great opportunities to manage taxes in retirement. It also manages sequence of returns risk. I talked about this a little bit before. Let's go back to our example where I had $100 or Lisa had $100, and let's say she wanted to take out $5 per year in retirement. Again, I'm trying to keep the math easy uh, for myself. 
Now, a 5% withdrawal rate, some people might say is kind of high, right? But let's go with it for now and say she's going to take uh, $5 out per year uh, for hopefully the rest of her life. But what happens if the year after Lisa retires, the market takes that 40% drop? It goes down 40% that year. So here's what the portfolio looks like now. Now Lisa doesn't have $100 to start with. She has $60 to start with. So instead of taking 5% of her portfolio, now she's taking one twelfth or about 8.5% of her portfolio. And everybody on the phone knows that you can't take that much money from your retirement account, right? She just can't recover from that loss in the early years uh, because of the fact that if you take $5,000 out or $5 out per year and you only have $60 left, that's going to run out before you do. So what do we do with the life insurance? Well, why not think about using the life insurance as your source of funds in the down years? So the market drops 40%. Instead of taking a stream of income from the life insurance, maybe what you could have done is you just said, you know what, I'm going to take all of my income this year from the life insurance because I want the market to make its way back up to 100 before I start taking that money out, right? So if I can let that money grow back to its original amount in my IRA, in my 401k, in my personal brokerage account, whatever the case may be, the the sustainability of my portfolio is going to be substantially better. Now, longevity risk. What if Ted and Lisa say, oh boy, we worked our whole lives. We raised these kids. We did a great job. Let's start going on cruises. Let's do all this travel that we've always wanted to do. And they spend too much in retirement. Now, if they both have life insurance, they can spend a lot in retirement because they don't have the same concern that a lot of us do, which is, boy, whatever we spend early on in retirement, if one of us dies, I'm not taking care of my spouse, right? So why not let life insurance refill the bucket for the surviving spouse? Obviously, that only works if you die years apart, but that is not uncommon. Healthcare risk. What happens if Lisa needs long-term care of some sort. Well, if she doesn't have the funds available in the life insurance, we know she has to draw down her portfolio more quickly than she expected to. So maybe the withdrawals from her portfolio are twice what they were before. And that is going to damage the sustainability of the portfolio. But in addition to that, think about this. If that money comes from a 401k, an IRA or something, those additional withdrawals themselves are going to ge generate taxable income. And so next April, she has to go back into the IRA or 401k and take more money out to pay the tax bill from the extra money she had to take out last year. And the snowball starts going down the hill at that point, right? So we know that uh, a healthcare situation uh, might cause some very real damage to that portfolio. So the question is, would a long-term care or chronic illness rider help? And absolutely it would. Uh, and then finally, we have a change of situation risk, right? Ted and Lisa are married. Maybe if Lisa dies first, Ted decides he doesn't want his life insurance anymore, right? So what could he do? Well, he could surrender it for cash value. Uh, and then we have something called a grow rider where we will guarantee uh, that you, in years 20 through 25, if you want to surrender it, we'll give you your premium back, right? So uh, it's, you hope, obviously, that with an, uh, an IUL accumulation type policy that you will do better than getting your premiums back. But it really is a nice little uh, guarantee to have uh, at the bottom of, uh, at the bottom of it for those clients who say, I don't know what the market's going to do for the next 20 and then finally, social security uh, risk. We know that when you have a married couple, uh, that when one of them dies, you lose the lesser of the two checks. So use life insurance to replace that check. Uh, or if you're worried that social security is going to run out of money, then maybe you better start thinking about, uh, about whether you need to have other sources of income. And the life insurance is great for that. Uh, if you want to explain 
any of these concepts to your clients. And it's just a little, I mean, it, it can be hard to do that with clients, right? Uh, you, we have some materials, certainly reach out. We would be more than happy uh, to share those uh, so that you can have those conversations with your clients. Uh, so if you can only take one thing from my presentation today, I'll ask you to take this. That is that life insurance is the perfect complement to the financial plan, not just at death, but also during life, but only so long as it, or as it makes the plan better and that it doesn't replace the plan uh, because then people are not interested. So I wanna thank you for your time. I know we went right up to our time. Uh, so I will ask, uh, Susanna, if we have a minute left for questions or if we just need to wrap it up. No, we, we sure do. And so if you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat box and I will pick it up. Um, I do have a couple here, Ron. First, Great. can you talk a little bit more about is the return of premiums taxable was one of the cool. questions we had. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, and that's a good question. Uh, on that, that grow rider where we return the premium, generally that's not going to be taxable. And the reason I say that is because it's just, it's a return of your investment in the contract, right? Now there's a couple of things that would impact that. Number one, if you did a 1035 from a policy that had gain, uh, and then you got that gain returned to you ultimately uh, through our grow rider, then there could be some gain there. Uh, also, basis does get reduced by uh, the cost of pay riders. So as a rule, return of premium is not going to be taxable, but there are just a couple little situations that, that you need to keep your eye on. That's why you need experts. Always a couple of a couple of gadgets. Always a there. couple of them, aren't there? Yeah. So. Uh, always caveat. Uh, so here's another one. What if my client can't afford to maximum fund an IUL policy? Should I talk to them about stepping up their contributions in, fur in further years or just buy less insurance? Oh, good. Yeah, th thank you for that. You know, when we're talking about permanent life insurance, I think sometimes people will go all in. It's either permanent life insurance or it's term insurance. And I really think that's a mistake. And the reason I say that is that if you don't buy enough permanent life insurance because you want to fund it appropriately, uh, and then the person dies, their family has a very real grievance against you, right? Because they needed a million dollars, you sold them $250,000 of permanent life insurance. Um, but also, uh, to more to the question is, well, how about if I just buy a million dollars worth of permanent life insurance and tell them they need to fund it more next year? I would say that is uh, rose-colored glasses, right? Most people don't remember that they said they would fund more next year and the year after and the year after. So I think the better way is buy as much permanent life insurance as you can fully fund, right? And then buy term insurance. And if they have more money in the future, then absolutely go back and convert the policy. But please don't bet on people uh, being better with their money a year from now than they are now, because then nobody's happy in the end. <laughs> and yeah, that's, that's, that's really what, so what, that's just understanding humans, right? right um, exactly. So uh, when, what, if, if you could repeat again, that you mentioned two pieces of software that you're using to comparing mm -hmm. the assets to the life assets and payouts. Can you repeat those again? Oh, absolutely. Uh, WinFlex is just uh, illustration software that I, I think a lot of the industry uses to illustrate life insurance. And it has a concept page. It's called Financial Alternatives. Obviously, if we can ever run an illustration, uh, please let us know. We also use a uh, software called Insmark. And Insmark is, is actually really good software. It's been around for decades uh, and, and shows uh, some of the more advanced concepts and, and you can import the life illustration numbers into it. So uh, two, uh, obviously, uh, WinFlex is a necessary piece of software. You can't illustrate life insurance. Uh, for us. So, yeah. And then finally, the question I'm seeing is really pertaining to, and this is, it's interesting because this is um, on a personal note, IULs have come up to me in my own life it, pertaining to college funding. And so one of the questions there is uh, life insurance and this type of whole life and IUL, does this appear on any FAFSA forms for college planning? And do you have any comments on that of where those are perhaps being uh, utilized for IUL for college funding, like super funding and drawing it down? Right. Uh, you know, and that's a fantastic question. And the answer is that 
the life insurance does not appear on the FAFSA. What I will say is that sometimes you might go to a private college and they might ask a question about other assets, right? Uh, so I will say the, the FAFSA itself does not ask anything about life insurance. So it really can be a great tool. And what I would encourage people to do uh, is, is look at insuring the parents as opposed to the kids uh, for two reasons. One, obviously, if the parents die, then you have the death benefit to pay for the college. But number two, what we see is that either people start when kids are 14, 15, in which case there's just not enough time uh, to fund the life insurance, or they start when the kids are really young and you can't get enough money into the life insurance to make a significant impact uh, because the death benefit's so high for a particular amount of premium. So I do think it's, it's a great way to fund uh, college. I think it's preferable most of the times to put the life insurance on the parents, uh, but uh, I'm certainly open to suggestion and I bet I'll get one after, uh, after today. So. <laughs> All right, well, I think that concludes our questions. Thank you so much, Ron Lee. Always a pleasure to have you join us here at NAFA. So well, everyone, you. we will see you back at one o'clock. Up next, we've got Cheryl Brown Hickerson and Mernice Oliver talking about the multicultural matchup and kind of testing to see, is your agency ready to handle and serve a multicultural market? So thank you again, Ron. We'll see everybody back in about 10 minutes. Thank you.